When I was 19 years old, I had the best job that any 19-year-old would ever want to have. I was a surgical technologist. If you don't know what a surgical technologist is, that's probably not a bad thing because that means you've never had inpatient surgery before. So that's good. And if you still don't know what a surgical technologist is, this is the person that passes instruments to Dr. Gray during Gray's Anatomy or to McSteamy or McDreamy during Grey's Anatomy, okay? So any Grey's Anatomy fans out there, you're gonna know what I'm talking about. So I had this case one day and I was scrubbed in and it was, um, it was a complicated case and the surgeon asked me for a particular kind of retractor and I didn't have it on my Mayo stand. And imagine the fear. So it's the surgeon and me and the Mayo stand and the instruments and she asks me and I'm like, oh, I don't have that retractor. So I look over my shoulder, it's not behind me. So we have this wireless system in the operating room where you can call down and ask for instruments. So I called down, I said, hey, could you guys send up this retractor? A minute goes by and I hear, uh, Patrick, we don't have that retractor. I'm like, what? And the surgeon's standing there and I'm standing there. And they said, we don't have that retractor. And I said, why not? And they said, it's too expensive, the hospital won't purchase it. Ugh. So the surgeon says, don't worry about it, Patrick, just give me this and we'll just keep on going, which is exactly what I did. Handed her the instrument, but I couldn't let this go. It kept bothering me. So at the end of the case, I took off my shoe covers and I marched my little 19-year-old self right down to the corporate suite. And I walked in and said to the executive secretary, my name is Patrick and I'd like to see the chief executive officer, Mr. Spurk. And she said, excuse me? I said, my name is Patrick, I work in the operating room, I'd like to see Mr. Spurt, please. And about that time, this body darkens the door. It's Mr. Spurk, the chief executive officer. And he says, excuse me, young man, can I help you? Now, I'm sorry, I, I grew up in Austin, Texas, so it was more like, excuse me, young man, can I help you? <laughs> and I said, my name is Patrick, I work in your operating room and I'd like to talk with you. He said, well, come on in and I walked in, sat down, and I complained about not having this instrument, and to this day, I have no earthly idea what Mr. Spurk said, what reason he gave me, but here's what I do remember. I remember him saying to me, Patrick, what do you do when you're not a surgical tech? And I said, I'm in nursing school. It was in nursing school, I just started. He said, well, that's wonderful. I wonder if you might consider changing your career. By the time I left that office, about 20 minutes later, I had changed not only my career, but I transformed my life because of the time that he took. And that's what I want to talk about with you today is taking the time and what that really means. You know, we don't often think about time. We don't think about it. It's kind of all around us. It's in music. Does anybody really know what time it is? Could I say time in a bottle? You know, we have that kind of music around us. but. We don't think about it. I'll tell you who does think about it are scientists, especially physicists at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The NIST scientists have a very interesting way of looking at time. They look at it using numbers and stuff. For example, I might define a second, we might define one second as one sixtieth of a minute, just a second, right? They define it as nine billion plus periods of radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyper-shifting levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. Oh, that hurt. That gave me such a headache to say that. I have no idea what that means. I always define a second as one Mississippi. And, and you can't, and you can't, why, who would define something based on an atom? You can't trust atoms anyway. You know why? They make up everything. I'll be here all day. But we do learn a lot about time from scientists. Albert Einstein taught us, because of his theory of relativity, that time moves more slowly the closer you get to the center of the earth. So that means that if you live on the first floor of an apartment building, you age more slowly than if you live on the 21st floor of an apartment building. And I am going to demonstrate. I'm going to get younger in front of you right now. Watch. <laughs> you know what else it does? It also tells us, it also tells us that your feet are younger than your face. 
the idiot. Your feet are younger than your face. I was showing everyone backstage this before. There's no more backstage left now. There were people back there. I was trying to show them my feet to say, look, they really do look younger than my face. Another really cool thing that scientists teach us about time is Planck time. Now, Planck time is the smallest measurable unit of time. To define it for you, I'll give you an example of how small Planck time is. It takes 550,000 trillion, trillion, trillion Planck times in order to blink once quickly. I shall demonstrate. See? Right there, Planck time, right there. I just did it again. Planck time's gone, 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 gone. Very small unit of time. But it's not really the scientist's definition of time that I find so fascinating. In fact, nobody really understands what physicists say anyway, right? They're silly. The most amazing thing about time is our personal relationship with time. We can manage it. We can expend it. We can owe it to someone. We can waste it. We can have a good time. We can have bad time. And we can't touch it, but we can feel it slipping through our fingers. That's what's so fascinating about time. So if we agree that giving of your time, if we agree that taking the time is so beneficial, why do we not do it? Why do we not do it more often? Well, I think there's a few reasons. I think there's some barriers that we face. I think, number one, we're disorganized. Ed Hallowell, former professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, wrote a book where he talked about culturally induced ADD. And he said, we have so many shiny things grabbing our attention, all of these things that are out there, we just can't possibly take the time. There's too much drawing us away. And that makes sense. If you've ever watched MSNBC or CNN, you can't watch just the anchor because there's a banner on the left side of the screen, there's a banner across the bottom. Just in case it's not enough information, you get bombarded with a whole bunch of other data. So what do we do with this? Well, we multitask, I'm telling you, as a professor of leadership, multitasking doesn't work. It doesn't work. The brain's not designed to multitask. Research shows us that when we multitask, we're less productive than when we go one task at a time. If you've ever been writing or reading and got interrupted, and then you had to kind of get back into that groove a little bit, you know, and kind of get back into where you were going, it takes a couple of seconds to do it, and that's the wasted time. A study at the University of London showed that when we multitask, our IQ actually drops. We don't need none of that, right? We don't need that. But I think the biggest barrier for us with time is when we consider time to be the soft skill. I am so worried that we are so enamored by data-driven multivariate regression logistic things that are dashboards with all kinds of dots on them and matrices and models and design thinking and logic regression. And you notice how I drop my voice? Because you can't, because when you're talking about that, it sounds a lot more serious when you do it that way. It's like, oh, serious analysis, man. We're talking strategy here. <laughs> hey, I got news for you. All that stuff doesn't matter when the soft skills aren't there. It doesn't matter. I'll tell you a story about a friend of mine. Um, I'm going to call him Dennis because that's his name. Um, <laughs> and Dennis, Dennis is a really cool guy. Dennis was a former border protection agent, and now he works for Aaron Marine. And Dennis and I got to talking about soft skills one day, and I asked him, I said, Dennis, tell me what you do for a living. And he said, you know, Patrick, it's not really exciting. He said, I fly drones over the Arizona border to look for drug smugglers. I also fly helicopters over the Arizona border and fixed wing aircraft. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's not cool at all. It's like watching Spike TV. That is, the, that is so cool. What a great job. Are you kidding me? Seriously? And he's like, oh yeah, he goes, but it's not really that big of a deal. I said, no, 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 that's so complicated. He goes, no, no, Patrick, no, listen to me, man, listen. And we also, the thing Dennis and I discovered is we both have a lot of daughters, so we're always tired. So every time I would see him, I'd be like, dude, you look so tired. He goes, I got daughters. How about you? He's like, oh, me too. I know what you mean. It's just crazy. So we really bonded a lot. But, you know, Dennis was awesome. So Dennis is telling me this story, and he said, no, he goes, the helicopter stuff, it sounds really complicated. He goes, but let me tell you something. He said, there are between three and 50,000 moving parts on a helicopter, depending on the kind of helicopter. And he said, and between two and 400 of those parts are crucial. 
In other words, if something goes bad with those parts, helicopter goes down. He said, I can take my helicopter up today to 1,000 feet, and I can turn everything off and let it just start to drop, which, go with me on this for a second. Doesn't that sound frightening? So the helicopter's starting to drop, and of course, everyone in the helicopter is getting younger as they're dropping. <laughs> because they're getting closer to the center of the earth, Einstein's theory. See, I tie this all together back to the beginning, right? So he said, and I can let it start dropping, and then I can feather the blades and follow a procedure to restart that helicopter and land it safely, and I can do it today, and I can do it tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. It's a process. It's a technical process, Patrick. It's not that big of a deal. He said, but if I make my wife mad today, and I take her flowers, that might work today. If I make her mad tomorrow and take her flowers a second time, maybe. If I make her mad a third day in a row and take her flowers again, she's filing the divorce papers. He said, Patrick, the soft stuff is the hard stuff. The soft stuff is the hard stuff. You know, I often go back to that 19-year-old surgical tech going into Mr. Spurk's office, and here's what I know. Here's what I remember about that. I try to capture the feelings, and I know that, I know that Mr. Spurk was not disorganized. I know that he wasn't multitasking, and I know that he knew the value of the soft skills, because when I left that office, I felt empowered, I felt engaged, I felt cared for, I felt that someone had seen something in me that I had never seen in myself, and it changed my life. And ever since then, I've tried to remember that lesson from him. I've tried to remember, I was 22 years as a naval officer, I tried to remember taking the time with our patients and the sailors that I led. I try to remember as a professor with graduate students taking the time to, to get them to learn how to write better and to analyze better and to help them on their career path. Working with federal executives who delivered democracy better than anybody on this planet and working with them to help them just create solutions to a very complex federal landscape. And taking the time with my friends and loved ones to be able to build that fabric of trust and love that matters more than anything in our lives. There's an author named Saul Alinsky who wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. And, and Alinsky talks about how we go through life and all we do is have a series of happenings occur, one happening after another. And he says that those happenings don't become experiences until we get the chance to take the time to reflect on them to think about them, to put them in the greater context. And I've got a wonderful happening about to come upon my life here in a few months. My youngest daughter, youngest of three, driving her cross country to college, Maryland to Oregon, just the two of us. We're already planning the trip. And she will tell you that she's the favorite, of course, of the three, but that, we'll leave that to the sisters to decide. But we're gonna have a great time. We're already having a great time and we haven't even left yet. But here's what I can tell you. I can tell you this. When I get back from that trip, two days after I return, I'm gonna look back on that trip and go, whoa, that was crazy. Two months afterwards, it's gonna feel even better. And two years afterwards, the joy that I'm gonna feel having had that happening with my daughter, it's gonna be immeasurable. Taking the time is not a distraction. It is life itself. So please take the time. It may change someone's life. It may change yours. And if you're really lucky, it may just do both at the same time. Thank you very much.